Okay. So finally we get to capillary pressure, right? We talked about pressure in the arteries, systolic, diastolic, hypertension, hypotension. We talked about pressure in the veins, how it's pretty low, um, but we have ways to kind of help the blood get back to the heart because the pressure is so low. Now we'll talk about the capillaries just to get our kind of bearings. Remember, pressure in the capillaries is relatively low, right? Where is pressure the highest in what vessels? What kind of arteries? The elastic arteries, right? The ones right by the heart. Pressure is highest in the elastic arteries that are right by the heart. Um, and then as we go through the system, what happens to the pressure? It decreases. Right? Does it decrease all the way around the system or does it decrease down to the capillaries and then increase again? Decreases all the way through the system, right? Pressure is highest in the elastic arteries when we leave the heart and then it goes down, 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 down the entire way through the system and it's lowest in the vena cava right before we get back to the heart. So the capillaries are right in the middle, right? So we've lost a lot of pressure. We've lost about 65 millimeters of mercury and pressure by the time we get down to the capillaries. The pressure is relatively low. The cross-sectional area is very high, right? Capillaries have the smallest diameter. They're very, very tiny, but because we have so many of them, the total cross-sectional area is high. That means that there's a lot of resistance, right? The vessels are itty bitty little vessels. And remember, the smaller the vessel, the more resistance to flow, because all the blood is in contact with um, the vessel wall, right, where there's friction. So that's why the blood flows so incredibly slowly through our capillaries, right, because there's so much resistance with all of this cross-sectional area. Now, remember, that's great. That's useful, because what happens in the capillaries? Exchange, right? Nothing enters or leaves the bloodstream unless it's in the capillary. So essentially, we rush the blood to the capillaries, and then we slow it down, Right, and we have time for stuff to enter and leave the bloodstream, and then we start to speed it back up and we rush it back to the heart. Now, this capillary exchange that we're talking about is extremely important, right? Nothing works without it. Like this essentially is life. We get things out of the blood and deliver them to our cells. We take wastes and products away from our cells. This is life. Um, when we talk about capillary exchange, we move materials in out of the blood across the capillary walls. So, thank you. We have a vessel here, right? And the capillary has how many layers in the capillary wall? One, right? What layer is that? Either, the, either name would work, right? The tunica intima, which is the endothelium, right? Or the endothelial layer. So what kind of cells are these that line it? Simple squamous cells. We call them endothelial cells. So that's it. Then we have like a really thin basement membrane. That's all we have. We don't have muscle and a bunch of collagen. Like this is a really, really thin walled vessel. So we have these simple squamous cells. One layer of really, really flat endothelial cells. Sometimes we see these little like junctions in between the cells. Right? We might see little pores present in the cells, um, but it's a really thin wall, that's the point. And capillary exchange is talking about the exchange of materials between the blood inside the vessel. And what's the fluid called out here? Interstitial fluid. Good, the interstitial fluid that's out here, right? And then stuff goes to our cells. When we talk about how things move between the blood and the interstitial fluid, there's multiple different forces that are involved in kind of pushing and moving materials back and forth. We'll talk about diffusion, which hopefully you guys are super familiar with at this point. We'll talk about filtration and also reabsorption. Last semester when I told you diffusion was like the most important concept you would learn, like I would not lie, it comes back over and over. So we'll start with diffusion. What's diffusion? movement of anything from high concentration to low concentration, right? If I put a drop of food coloring in a bunch of water, the food coloring is not going to stay in this one tight little drop where it's really concentrated. The coloring is going to spread out, right? And by the end of the lecture, we will have pink water. We won't have clear water with one really red dot. 
it will spread. That's diffusion. Does this take energy? No, the cell doesn't have to spend any energy to make this happen, right? It's passive. No ATP is required. This is a passive process. This nature causes this to happen. Um, again, we'll talk about this more when we do respiratory, but it's because the molecules are always moving, right? In a liquid and gas, the atoms don't like stay still. They're constantly bouncing all around, so they spread out naturally. That's diffusion. Now, when we talk about things diffusing in and out of the bloodstream, different molecules will take different routes to get in and out of the blood. Okay? It's diffusion, so we're always saying high concentration to low concentration. But depending on what it is we're looking at, it can go between cells, it can go through a pore, it can cross the cell, like it just depends on what it is that we're actually looking at. So, water, um, ions, so give me an example of an ion. Sodium, calcium, potassium, potassium fluoride, right? Charged molecules, or not molecules, charged atoms, I guess. Um, these are ions. So water, ions, and then small polar molecules like glucose. Okay, so small polar molecules like glucose. What do all of these things have in common? Water, polar molecules like glucose, ions. They're all hydrophilic. They're all charged in some way. Right, either full charge like the ions or partial charge. Remember water is polar, right? There's partial positive and partial negative. All of these have some sort of a charge. Because of that, they're all hydrophilic. What does hydrophilic mean? Water loving. They like water because likes dissolve likes. Water is charged or it's polar, right? It's got partial charges. So things that have partial charges like it. So they'll interact with each other just fine, right? These are hydrophilic. Now, because of that, remember when we look at these cells, these endothelial cells, what are they, what are they lined with? What's the plasma membrane made of? Phospholipids. Phospholipids, right? A phospholipid bilayer. Remember when we look at the plasma membranes, we have two layers of phospholipids. In the middle is a bunch of lipids. Do lipids like water? No. no, right? You put oil and water together and they separate. You can shake it all you want. When you set it down, they're gonna separate. They don't like each other. So these things that are hydrophilic, that like water, do not like this lipid core in the plasma membrane of cells. So they do not want to travel directly across it. They won't. They do not want to come in contact with those lipids. So when they're crossing in and out of the bloodstream, they need some other place to cross, some other way to get in and out. So they can do that a couple different ways. They can go between adjacent endothelial cells. We have small clefts present between cells in our, continuous, in our normal like, continuous capillaries. And that will allow some of these really small hydrophilic things to cross in and out of the bloodstream. We also have some channels present. Um, channels, remember, are like little tunnels. Okay, so a tiny little tunnel that will allow things to cross in and out of the cell without actually having to come in contact with that lipid bilayer. So we do have some channels present that will allow things to go through, uh, like aquaporins or water pores. Uh, but we do have some channels, or like sodium channels, potassium channels, those things allow things to cross. And then also remember, fenestrated capillaries have larger pores present that allow these things to cross really rapidly. Okay, so remember we said we saw these fenestrated capillaries in the intestines. Um, where else did we see them? Kidney, um, and then some of our endocrine glands. Because again, in these areas, it's important for this stuff to be able to to cross, to get in and out of the blood really, really fast. Like in your intestines, we're absorbing a lot of ions, a lot of glucose, a lot of stuff has to get absorbed really rapidly into the blood. So we like these pores or fenestrations, so we don't have to like slowly wait for this process to occur through all of the tiny little channels. It happens really fast through the pores. Okay. 
So, but this is not the only stuff that has to diffuse in and out. We have some larger water soluble compounds. So these would be things like some hormones and other like polypeptides. What's a polypeptide? Uh, multiple peptides, right? So like on the way to becoming a protein, you put multiple amino acids together, right? And we can call that a polypeptide. It can be a few amino acids, it can be a lot of amino acids, but you string together some amino acids and you call that a polypeptide. It's big, right? Relatively big, um, bigger than like glucose. So these things are pretty big, but they're still water soluble. They like water. So do they like this liquid bilayer? No. no. So they're not going to go straight through the cells. So they need some sort of a hole. These are, they're, notice I said large. They're too big for these itty bitty clefts in between the cells in our continuous capillaries. So these cannot cross in our continuous capillaries. We need fenestrated capillaries because what do fenestrated capillaries have? larger pores, right? They've got larger passageways present. So again, I just told you guys, but where did we see these? Intestines, kidney, oh, I almost said hormones, endocrine glands. Um, <clears throat> okay, again, places where we might need to absorb a lot of polypeptides or places where we might need to be secreting hormones into the bloodstream. Um, so lipids and lipid soluble materials. So things like fatty acids. Okay, but more importantly, what two things can you tell me that are lipid soluble that we would have crossing in and out of the blood all the time? Oxygen. And? Carbon dioxide. Beautiful. Okay, oxygen and carbon dioxide. The respiratory gases. Those are lipid soluble. So anything that's the small lipid soluble things can go directly through the endothelial cells. Okay, they're lipid soluble. They like lipids. They don't mind this lipid bilayer. So those things can diffuse straight through the plasma membranes of the cells. They don't need a cleft. They don't need a gap. They don't need a pore. Um, they very easily just cross straight through the cells to get in and out of the bloodstream. And again, that's one of the reasons why it's so important we have such a thin little barrier. If we had a bunch of cells stacked on top of each other, it would be a lot harder to go through. Because remember, distance matters when we're talking about diffusion. This is a nice short little distance with just that tunica in mind. Finally, we have really, really big things, okay, like plasma proteins or blood cells. These things are too big to even fit through the pores and the fenestrated capillaries. So remember, we have highly specialized capillaries that are called sinusoids, and we have those in areas like the liver. Where else? Spleen and bone Good, the liver, spleen, and bone marrow. Okay, so like, where do we make plasma proteins? Good, the liver. Right? So we have to have sinusoids in the liver so that once we make them, we can push them into the blood easily. So we've got bigger gaps present between cells and these sinusoids to fit the really big stuff through. Okay, so, but again, remember that this is diffusion. So what does that mean? I'm going from what to what? High to low. High to low. So understand right off the bat, diffusion is going from high concentration to low concentration. Depending on what the molecule is, it's going to take a different route to get in and out of the blood. So be able to combine those concepts. Like if I say that I have uh, more oxygen in the blood, right, or the concentration of oxygen is higher in the blood than in the interstitial fluid, what's going to happen? Oxygen is going to diffuse to the interstitial fluid. How? Straight through, right? Straight through the endothelial cells. Okay, or if I'm talking about plasma proteins, that I have more plasma proteins in the interstitial fluid because say I'm in the liver and I just made them, that otherwise it would not happen. But I have more plasma proteins in the interstitial fluid. Um, where are they going to diffuse? Into the blood, how? Through the gaps between cells and sinusoids. Okay, so again, put those concepts together.
So diffusion is one way that things get in and out of the bloodstream. Filtration is another force that allows us to push things um, out of the blood and kind of drive this capillary exchange or this mix between the blood and the interstitial fluid. So in general, filtration occurs when we remove solutes as a solution is forced, like pressure, physically forced across the porous membrane. Hey, think of any time you filter anything, like in your water, right? Your water, like if you have a filter on your water at home. The liquid is forced at pressure across some sort of filter or a membrane. The liquid comes through. Some solutes make it through. If they're small enough, they come through. The bigger solutes get trapped in a filter, right? That's exactly what filtration is in the blood. We're pushing fluid, forcefully pushing it from the blood into the interstitial fluid. The wall of the vessel creates our filter, right? Because it's a porous membrane. There are pores that allow some things through, but other stuff can't make it through the membrane. Other stuff gets trapped because it's too big. So we're literally just filtering things from the blood across the vessel wall into the interstitial fluid. When we see this happening, we see in the, um, the vessels it's driven by a pressure called hydrostatic pressure. Again, that's just physical force. And think about it, we have the heart generates all this pressure, so this blood gets forced forward with pretty good pressure, and we're cramming a bunch of fluid into tiny, itty bitty little vessels, microscopic little vessels. So you can imagine that the fluid has some pressure that it's pushing out with. Right? As the fluid gets pushed forward, it's pushing in all directions, so it's pushing out on the vessel wall. That's hydrostatic pressure, the physical pressure pushing against the wall um, as the blood is crammed into that small vessel. Again, it's going to push water and small solutes that can make it across the membrane from areas of high pressure to lower pressure. So as long as the pressure in the vessels is more than the pressure in the interstitial fluid, we'll have some pressure that, that's driving filtration. We see that water in small solutes, so things like ions, things like glucose, get forced across the capillary wall into the interstitial fluid. Right? They're small enough to fit in the little clefts between cells, um, and they can get pushed out and into the interstitial fluid. But larger solutes are stuck in the blood. Okay, so what's a really big solute? Plasma proteins. Okay, so plasma proteins, um, cells. Okay, so like your red blood cells are too big to get pushed out from the blood in the interstitial fluid. Okay, so we're pushing all of the, the water and the small stuff out. We're leaving the really big solutes in the blood. And this could kind of vary depending on what type of capillary we're looking at, guys. But I'm just, let's just think really generally like continuous capillary. Reabsorption, okay? Just thinking really generally, what is, when you reabsorb something, what do you do? Take it back, Take it back right? Like filtration is when we push the fluid out, when we reabsorb it, we absorb, right? We take it back in again. So reabsorption is the opposite of filtration. Filtration is when we push out, Reabsorption is when we pull fluids and solutes back into the bloodstream. Reabsorption um, is not the result of hydrostatic pressure. Okay? It's not that physical force that, of the pressurized blood pushing out. It's the result of osmotic pressure. Okay, you guys remember osmosis? Um, in general, what's the, the simplest definition of osmosis? Beautiful, the diffusion of water. Hey, remember, we want to even out osmotic pressures, which is like the concentration of stuff, right? All the solutes in the fluid. Um, that relates to its osmotic pressure, its osmolarity. And we want to have even, or nature wants to have even concentrations of stuff inside and outside of the blood. 
So with diffusion, we're looking at each individual solute, right? Just glucose, just oxygen, just sodium. With osmosis, we're looking at all of them put together, all the solutes together combined. With diffusion, we say that that one solute that we're talking about goes from high concentration to low concentration, right? If I have more of it in the blood, it's gonna diffuse out to the interstitial fluid. But with osmosis, I'm saying that can't happen. If I have more plasma proteins in the blood, I can't have them diffuse out to the interstitial fluid. They're stuck, right? They can't leave. So I'm stuck with all these solutes in the blood and I can't get them out. So the only thing we can do to try and even up concentrations is to then increase the amount of fluid in the blood, right? Then the concentration will decrease. If you can't decrease the solutes, you can increase the fluid. So that's this, this osmotic pressure or osmotic pull, I think is a, an easier way to understand it, is describing it as an osmotic pull um, because it pulls fluid back into the bloodstream. Okay, we call it the blood colloid osmotic pressure. It's the osmotic pressure um, or osmotic pull of the blood, mostly because of all of the plasma proteins that are stuck in the bloodstream that won't actually diffuse out or won't get filtered out. Um, <clears throat> technically, osmotic pressure is the pressure, the physical force that's required to prevent osmosis. Okay, but that just, like, that just sounds like too much. The easiest way I think to think of it is to just think of the higher the concentration of solutes, the higher the osmotic pressure. Okay, so the more stuff you have, the more the osmotic pressure is. And the water's always going to cross to the side with more stuff. Is that okay? Some technical definition. <laughs> Good. So, there's always this interplay going on between filtration and reabsorption. Okay, both of them are happening in the capillary bed. Um, so we see that we push stuff out and then we pull stuff back in. And it creates this kind of flushing action. Right? And that ensures that the interstitial fluids in the plasma are always in communication with each other. It's really important for preventing um, like little kind of clusters of really high ion concentrations or clusters of you know, hormones or just little clusters everywhere. We want to kind of keep everything filtering and moving and spread out throughout the body. Um, this is also important because it helps to accelerate um, nutrients, the, the movement of nutrients whether we're absorbing them or whether we're distributing them to cells, if we just relied on diffusion alone, it wouldn't happen quick enough. We wouldn't be able to drop things off quick enough by the time the blood left the capillary bed. So this filtration reabsorption, this flushing action helps to speed up all of that so that we make sure we can deliver nutrients quick enough. Um, it's also important for the immune system. We'll look at this in a little bit, but we'll see how some of this fluid ends up making its way to the lymphatic system and that's where we run it through lymph nodes and we screen it and we look for pathogens uh, so that we can alert the immune system to any infection that might be present out in the periphery. Okay, so it's really important that we have this filtration and reabsorption occurring. 